My name is Marissa Career Hernandez. I'm a member of the Coalition of Housers COHO, which is hosting today's event. COHO is a network of new and emerging leaders working in and advocating for affordable housing in the South Bay. The goal of COHO is to support the leadership and professional development, diverse community of practitioners in the affordable housing industry and among industry partners. I want to thank you, Anna and Dixie, for working so hard on this fireside chat series, Careers in Affordable Housing. And thank you, Kriti, for being tech support. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for, for being with us today. And we're really, I'm really excited for this discussion and excited to see that many of you are involved. So without further ado, I'm so excited to talk to you today, Regina. Today is actually our second event in this series and with many more to come. So please stay connected to COHO in our future events. Regina is the Director of Housing Development at First Community Housing and is responsible for securing funding for and managing the design and development of the affordable housing pipeline. Previous to joining, Regina was a member of the National Development Council's East team providing housing and economic development consulting services to several East Coast municipalities and leading their green initiatives. She has also worked at the National Housing Trust structuring the financing for and overseeing the rehabilitation of affordable housing properties while employing green construction features. Regina received her master's of city planning from the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's in urban studies from Stanford. Thank you so much, Regina, for being here with- Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I think this will be fun. Um, I love talking about affordable housing. I think it's a wonderful industry. Thank you. We are excited and we, we, we share the same sentiment. <laughs> Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and what are three words you would use to describe yourself? Yes. Um, so I am, as you mentioned, the director of housing development for First Community Housing. And um, I live in the city of San Jose. First Community Housing's office is in downtown San Jose. So I live here downtown um, near Japantown in San Jose. And I've been here for six years, which is uh, the amount of time that I've been at FCH. I relocated from the East Coast um, to, to San Jose. Uh, previous to here, I was in North Carolina. And before that, Washington DC. And before that, Philadelphia. Uh, I'm originally from the East Bay. So coming back to San Jose was coming home for me, uh, but I'm from Richmond, California, which is a little bit north of, of Oakland. So born and raised in Richmond. And, um, and as you, you mentioned, I went to undergrad uh, locally here in the Bay Area. So I'm, I'm excited, I'm married. I have two young girls. One is, they just turned one and five. So um, yeah, pandemic's been rough, um, but I just feel so grateful to be here in December um, of 2020 uh, when we've lost so many of our, you know, fellow humans um, this year. So um, three words to describe me. Okay, I, I choose optimistic. I used to say that I um, wear rose-colored glasses, but I think 2020 has changed that a little bit. <laughs> but I think you need a, a, a fair dose of um, optimism to do the type of work that we do in affordable housing, especially from uh, the developer side. I think that um, being able to take you know, a piece of dirt and turn it into uh, housing for the most vulnerable you need a, a little bit of optimism. There's some, some challenges that come up when we do this work. The other word that I will choose is humble. Um, I choose that word because we've been talking a lot more about humility at First Community Housing and how important it is in the work that we do in the way that we like to collaborate and work together to make our projects come to fruition. I really think that, you know, um, the the it's not... The work is, you can't point to any one person and say that they are the reason that this project happened. There's just so many people. And the, the, the sooner you know that, 
um, even though you may have put a lot of effort and time into the project, the sooner you know that it's not just you, it's a collective effort, I think the more successful you can be in, in this work. Um, and the last word I'll choose is really mom. I think I can't not choose that word just given the day-to-day -day, um, right now and how intense it is to be a parent in 2020. Um, but I, I also think that, you know, having a very compelling reason to turn work off <laughs> is, is helpful, um, you know, especially now that there is no office that I go to. So I have to be able to sort of switch between work and home, uh, again, just to, to promote self-care and take care of myself, because uh, I think this work can be very all-consuming. So those are the three words that, that I choose. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for really grounding us in the reality of what we've all seen today and why it's just so important for us to continue doing the work that we're doing to make sure that everyone has safe, stable and affordable housing. It is truly a lifesaver. And I wanted to lead with my next question and then we'll open it up to the group to answer, to ask their own question. Can you explain your job in everyday, ter everyday terms and what your career path was like to end up here? Yes, so I'm gonna start with the my career path because um, I, I personally feel like I've chosen this path. Um, I was, I went to Stanford to do engineering and I ended up switching to urban studies because I felt that uh, there was a, an interdisciplinary nature to it. And by switching to that program, I stumbled upon a course called the Design and Construction of Affordable Housing, believe it or not. Um, I think there are more of those courses in, in programs nowadays, but I, I think at that time it was fairly rare. It was a, a course in the civil engineering department and uh, it, it really introduced me to the industry by you know showing the breadth of affordable housing developers, um, the breadth of uh, populations that can be served, uh, the, the, the strength of this region when it comes to affordable housing development, really, because I've worked on the East Coast as well. And it's just, I haven't, I've never seen it as strong as it is here in terms of just, um, you know, all of the folks committed to moving this work forward. But then again, we're driven by the need, the great need for affordable housing. And so I got this glimpse of an industry and career professionals who were dedicated to understanding the needs of low-income people and building housing to serve those needs. And I just thought that was amazing. Um, and then I think what really solidified it for me, the, you know, the commitment to the field was the fact that it was in that course that I learned and realized that I had grown up in affordable housing. I didn't even know it, you know, I think, that um, you know what us professionals don't realize is that the people and most um, importantly the children who are raising affordable housing, we don't know what that means or what that is. It's just a home, you know. It's a house. It's it means that you know maybe instead of working three jobs, your parents only have to work one or two or one and a half, you know, and you get to see them more often. Or it means that, you know, maybe it means you have access to better schools, or maybe it means you have, you know, more food on your table because less of your parents' paycheck is going to, um, to rent and it's going to other, thing, other necessities. And so when I realized that, when I realized that my quality of life as a child benefited from growing up in Section 8 housing, I, I said, wow, I want to do that. And so that's when I chose to go um, to Penn's uh, city planning program, very focused on affordable housing development, you know, trying to gain skills around real estate finance and, and, um, and community economic development. And then I went on to uh, work as for a nonprofit developer the National Housing Trust in Washington, D.C., doing uh, really exciting work 
uh, in DC, they have a tenant uh, opportunity to purchase act. So it's the ability for tenants to buy their building when they go up for sale and maintain the affordability. So I got to work with residents who could have been displaced, but they were empowered enough to purchase their buildings and, and try to understand, you know, uh, real estate finance and tax credits and all of that to pre preserve their housing. Working that closely with tenants was really exciting, especially ones that were empowered to make decisions around their own housing. Um, and so I did preservation work there, affordable housing preservation. And then I um, joined the, the National Development Council and um, they're primarily, they're nat nation nationwide. They work um, uh, primarily in consulting, providing technical assistance to municipalities, um, housing authorities, other nonprofits who want to build capacity. And the, the nonprofits I work with primarily wanted to build capacity around affordable housing. And so I got to work with um, churches in the DC and Baltimore area that wanted to build housing. Um, I was able to work with housing authorities um, who wanted to uh, move their projects forward. Um, I was able also to do community facilities like um, um, African American museums and YMCAs and understand the critical pieces that those play in, in success for low-income neighborhoods. So I feel like I got like a more um, holistic picture of community development doing that work for five years. And then uh, when I came to San Jose and, and joined First Community Housing, it was definitely with the intent of coming back to affordable housing. Uh, development so that I could specifically be doing what I do now day to day, which is looking for opportunities to acquire property, um, whether it's a piece of dirt that's vacant or whether it's an existing uh, apartment complex um, for acquisition rehab, but looking to acquire properties to build um, or preserve affordable housing. And so, you know, our day to day is working to negotiate contracts for acquiring sites. Um, I lead that effort. And um, there's a lot of opportunity right now in Silicon Valley with the market sort of changing um, for acquiring land for affordable housing. I work on uh, securing funding. That's a lot of my day to day because we're a nonprofit. We don't typically utilize our own funds to do a lot of the development and to push the projects forward. So a lot of work is done on acquiring um, acqu acquiring or securing the financing to move the projects forward because we are talking about millions of dollars. And um, really just working and sort of trying to use the equity lens um, to work with my team on, you know, what, what could this community be? Who could we serve? Um, and also trying to work with local municip um, municipalities to understand their needs and um, for development. You know, how, may, how many units can we build? Who can we serve? Who will live here in the future? What sort of services will we provide? And so continuously working with partners at the cities, at the, the counties, uh, even at the state governments to understand what sort of funding is in place and how they can support the affordable housing we're looking to build. And um, also on my team, we manage construction, of course. So as the projects become under construction, making sure that all the partners involved, including the contractor and the architect are getting paid and we're drawing down funds to do that. And um, it's all in a way that we're, you know, properly, properly accounting for the use of public funds and public subsidy. And so um, it's an exciting job. And what we do at, a, at First Community Housing, we have a lot of variety. So every project's actually very different from, from the next, which is exciting. And um, it's never dull. And there's always something that comes up that we have to work through. And I, I, don't, I don't even think I've seen the same issue come up on 
any different project. It's always something new, something different that you have to work through. And so that's where that optimism comes in and that humility, because you really have to have a, a, a mindset where you don't take personally the challenges, but you do take it personal, make it your personal responsibility to move the project forward. Thank you. That was really powerful what you just said right there. And I do want to open it up if there's anyone in the group who wants to ask a question now, what we've already talked about. Dixie, are there any questions from the audience? I don't see any questions from the audience or hands raised, but if you have a question for Regina, please feel free to raise your hand or put your question in the chat box and we'll get to you. Thank you. So we'll get back right into my next question. You are balancing a lot of responsibilities. What do you love most about your job and overcoming the challenges that you mentioned? Uh, I think what I love most is, you know, the fact that, I think there's two things. There's the motivation, uh, the, the fact that we're creating housing for the most vulnerable, for those who need it. And, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to um, make neighborhoods and communities more equitable so that low-income families can, in this area, in the Bay Area, stay closer to, you know, the core of the cities and um, where the jobs are in the Bay Area and resources. But for me, I think the most, uh, the, the part I enjoy most is probably the technical part, you know. Um, it's probably looking at uh, the, the, the capital stack, which is the sources of funds and trying to figure out how are we going to make this a reality? Um, and that's just my background. My technical background is what drives me. I, I, what I love about affordable housing is that no matter who you are, um, what your, your strengths are, what you enjoy doing, there's a piece in the work that you can really enjoy doing because it's just such a variety. And so for me, I do love uh, the numbers. I do love the problem solving aspect and that feeling when you know you have a project that works and, and you can talk to someone about it and explain how this is gonna work and move forward. And you can see that partner understand that and say, yes, we're gonna work with you to move this forward. Uh, I, think, I think that's really exciting and all the relationships you build because everyone has a piece to play from the lenders to the architects to the contractors to um, you know the, the municipalities, everyone has a piece to play in moving this forward. When you do that work of looking at the technical aspect and explaining it to them, sharing that vision and then they get on board with you, that's just really exciting. Thank you for sharing. I wanted to pause again to see if there is any other questions from the group that wanted to be shared out, Dixie. Yeah, we do. We have a great question from Ruth. Ruth, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, we'd invite you to do so now, or I can read that question for you. Sorry, Ruth, I have to, Hello? I have to unmute you. <laughs> oh, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, my question is, did you have a mentor that helped guide you throughout your career? Uh, if so, how did you establish that relationship? And any tips for um, people who are looking to find a mentor like you or someone who's doing what you're doing, wants to get into affordable housing? How would they approach someone in your field? Hi, Ruth. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, I didn't really have a mentor. I think that uh, a lot of, I think there's a, a lot of, um, you know, it's interesting because I've heard the, the more I've come up in the profession, you know, having a, a mentor is a great resource. And I, I didn't have one. And I do think that that's a challenge for a lot of um, 
you know, women of color, minorities, um, having access to people who can play the role of mentor. I, I had some great supervisors. Um, I will share that every single supervisor I've ever had was a white male, um, but they shared a lot of information with me. And, you know, I don't know if it, if there was a reason that once I had that um, supervisory relationship, it didn't mature into a mentorship, but they were, you know, great supervisors. I learned a lot. And um, I certainly, you know, am grateful for them hiring me and helping me learn the industry and all that it offers. But I would definitely um, encourage folks out there and including my younger self to seek out a mentor um, and that, you know, reaching out to someone and just asking. I, I, I actually went through that challenge of maybe I had been in San Jose a year, maybe two, and I really wanted to ask someone to be a mentor for me. And I didn't know how to do it. I didn't feel like I had the, the justification for them giving me that extra bit of time. And I would definitely say, you know, just ask and make the time um, because I know how great, how helpful it is. The other thing I would add, um, what I believe I benefited from is what I would call peer mentorship, which is um, the idea that your peers, you can learn a lot from. And, you know, getting together with people who are in a similar situation as you within your organization or in other organizations can be as beneficial, especially when you, you know, may identify with them as being a woman of color or a person of color or a minority um, in the field. And just having that, that ability to talk with them on a level outside of just work, but on a level of personal, you know, um, challenges how to stay encouraged, how to um, overcome um, all of the different barriers that are there because uh, I've definitely done a good amount of that with people in the industry and outside of the industry. And I believe that really propelled me to where I am today, just being able to, to talk with my peers about like, this feels like a challenge. Is this made up? Is it in my head? Or is there really a glass ceiling that that's there? And, um, and I've, I've had those conversations, they benefited me. I've talked about, you know, how do I ask for a raise? I don't think I can do this. And gotten encouragement for someone who is, you know, a, who last year, maybe they went through the same thing and they were able to say, this was my strategy, this is what I did and it worked out. So I, I definitely encourage people to get peer mentors, even if they haven't identified, you know, mentors that are, more senior in the industry, but if you have identified someone that's a mentor, just ask. And um, you know, you can't build that relationship if you don't ask. That is really good advice. And that was actually my next next question. So thank you, Ruth, for, for bringing that up. Um, I did wanna ask one last question and then we'll open it up to the group you had talked about some of the challenges and how you're able to use your peer mentorship. What are some other, um, what are some other tips to achieve work-life balance and avoiding burnout? Well, again, you know, given what 2020 has thrown at us, um, I would say just be kind to yourself, set boundaries uh, around work, work time, um, it's tough. It's tough. I, I focus very, I, I focus very diligently on um, my team's self-care, trying to avoid burnout for them, because it's just been a really hard year for that, uh, not being able to have the personal connection that we're used to in doing this work um, and being able to meet in person. But I would say definitely set boundaries. Um, if you can carve out time for yourself to do at least one thing a day, there was um, an email I was getting and it just had a self-care note and it just, 
just reading that email gave me even just the five or 10 minutes to re remind myself to do something for me. And I really like that. And yeah, I, I think it's, it's a huge challenge. Be, I think in this day and age, what, what we have been from is, in 2020 is being able to talk about it. So now we don't have to sort of deal with it in silence. We can, we can say to our supervisor, I need to take a, a day, or um, we can tell, you know, whomever in, we're working with, you know, um, I, I, need, I need this time, uh, you know, I need more time to get this to you. Just be gracious with yourself is what I would say for self-care. That's really good advice as well. Thank you so much. And I wanted to open it up for the rest of the group. If you all had any more questions, Dixie. Yeah, we do. We have a great question from Kyla. Uh, Kyla, I'd like to invite you to unmute and ask your question or I'm happy to do that for you. Hi, I, I actually got booted out of the call for a little bit. So I lost um, the full text of what I had typed out. But uh, Regina, I was basically wondering if you could speak to um, climate change and basically uh, the impacts that it will have on your work um, in affordable housing. Um, I, it's my understanding that you work with uh, making sure that it's green and sustainable. Um, and I'm sure that job will become more difficult as more people are displaced by climate change. Um, mm -hmm. And I just was, yeah, wondering if you could speak to that. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Kyla. I will, I will say uh, just to start that I am not the sustainability expert at First Community Housing. So we do rely on experts when it comes to making sure that our developments um, achieve a high standard of su sustainability, but that isn't my expertise. What I will say is that we are uh, extremely committed to sustainability because of the reality of climate change. And because of the reality that we know reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, among other things, can, in, in the buildings that we create, right? Because we're going in, we're taking potentially um, a piece of land that doesn't have anything on it. And we're building uh, a building that will house, you know, maybe a hundred people, maybe more. And those people may spend, you know, 65% or more of their time in that building that they call their home. And so what we've recognized at First Community Housing is that sustainability in the, the development that we do is extremely important. It's a high priority. Our standards for construction is LEED Platinum, which is the highest uh, LEED certification that you can get. Um, and we use LEED uh, for homes certification. And that's because we've heard from our residents the benefits that they have reaped from their homes being more sustainable, which means, you know, the choice of materials being more healthy. Um, the location of the building is closer to transit, so they don't have to rely on cars. Um, us implementing programs, like giving them free transit passes in Santa Clara County so that they have a, a no cost to that access to transportation, really benefiting them. And so we're committed to all those things because of the reasons you pointed out, but I, I apologize, I can't speak to I don't know the details of, of um, you know, um, all the details of climate change that you're referring to, um, unfortunately. That was super helpful. We had another question for you from the audience and that was, what is the biggest piece of advice you have for people just starting out in the business? Well, I think it's a frame of mind. And, and, and of course I'm coming from the developer side of things. But to me, it's important to understand um, as a, a nonprofit developer that yes, absolutely, um, our buildings are about the communities we work in and the residents we serve. 
But our jobs are to envision what this new development, this new part of the community can be. And then as it, you know, as it is something that is intangible, it's a vision, it's our job to give it, you know, meat, to give it bones and to go out and build partnerships and explain what this project will be. And as the project moves along, it becomes more and more tangible, more real, more based on fact, less uh, creativeness. And that's okay. That's okay. I think the frustration of that I've seen with most early on project managers is that we don't have all the facts from the beginning. Because that's what you want, right? You, someone asks you, you know, you know, how big is the two bedroom gonna be? You wanna just be able to tell them exactly the answer. Um, or, you know, how much is this gonna cost? Or how, t how tall is the building gonna be? Or, you know, how many people will, will you serve? Or what type of population e even? early on is not quite nailed down. And I think that's a challenge for a, a entry level project manager who wants to have all the answers and you know share those answers. And with every good intention, we don't know. So how do you explain to someone you know, what you know, convince them of what you know while knowing that there's the potential um, of it changing. And so to me, that's the hardest part. Um, you know, I think perspective wise for someone new to the industry is understanding like, how, how do I not know this? You know, how is this not, you know, 100% facts? How, how, how is it changing constantly every single day? And that is the nature of development. And I think that no matter what side you're on, if you're a lender, if you're um, um, you know, a government staffer and you've seen development, you, under, you get to understand that, that it changes over time. And so for me, the job of uh, convincing my you know, um, teammates who are early on is, is that that is just a part of it. And that's, that's the, the world we're given. And, you know, the sooner we can grasp that, the, the better project manager you'll be. Thank you so much. Marissa, back to you. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. I'll ask another question. Um, were there other career paths that you were interested in and what, uh, in the housing industry, like you said, there's a lot of different different ways to be involved. Were there other things that caught your attention and how you chose development? Yes, well, you know, I, I did, as I mentioned before, do some work um, in community development. Um, and I've also um, done some work in uh, economic development. The, I would say, um, there was a time when early on I got exposed to um, the evolution of the solar industry where it met affordable housing. And um, that was really growing and taking off and there, and there was um, an opportunity to explore that path of, you know, how do you, um, develop and finance solar photovoltaic arrays using the same sort of structure of, you know, identifying sites, but maybe a site is the rooftop of a property, or maybe it's, you know, um, putting it over canopies in, uh, in surface parking. So the site might be different, but utilizing tax credit financing uh, utilizing debt from the similar types of debt that we use in affordable housing to produce uh, more solar power, um, which you know would also benefit 
you know, our communities in, in terms of climate change and reducing reliance on fossil fuels. So I, I think at some point I considered going more down that path because there really is a synergy between affordable housing and a solar PV production. But um, ultimately I have chosen to stay in affordable housing just because of my personal connection to the industry and understanding just how critical um, a roof over your head um, a safe place to live, a safe place to raise your family, and the the high cost of, of housing here in the Bay Area, the fact that people are getting displaced. Um, people are being full, uh, forced to move very much out of the range of the communities that they grew up in because of market dynamics. Um, and capitalism and those types of things. And so uh, that's why I've stayed in housing. Thank you so much. And I saw that Christy had put in the chat. If you please can, um, if you're leaving early or at the end of session, if you could please fill out the survey so we can plan for future events. We're really thankful to have Regina and we're excited for our next speakers to come in the future. Are there any last questions? Hey, there was one, one other question. It's really a good one too. It's got some meat and potatoes to it. Do you have any, any thoughts on best things to stay current in the field, whether that's a specific study curriculum um, or more broadly throughout the affordable housing uh, industry? such as what to read, what organizations to join, or, or what people to follow online? Oh, that is really good. I think that in terms of following, like on LinkedIn or something like that, there are uh, national organizations like Enterprise Community Partners, um, LISC, that are at the forefront of trying to solve some of the biggest issues that exists in affordable housing. I think that's always interesting. One magazine that I've followed is um, Affordable Housing Finance. I think they do a good job of highlighting projects that are interesting and unique and developers who are doing unique work to sort of you know stay on top of what's going on in the field. Um, I think in the state of California, that we are, there's like a, I think it's like a HCD listserv that does a great job of sharing articles. And whenever I have an intern, I tell them to follow that to see, you know, what's going on throughout the state of California. It kind of pulls together a bunch of articles. Um, if you're in the field and you're a professional and you're just trying to get up to speed, um, I, I, incentivize people or encourage people to read the tax credit regs. It doesn't sound exciting, but that was what I did whenever I um, worked from one state to the next. Um, so I think, you know, if you're doing the work and you want to understand, you know, a little bit more about, you know, how this all shakes out, which projects move forward and which don't, um, I encourage reading the regs. And if you're somewhere else, uh, like, you know, I think we had someone who may have been in Pennsylvania or any other state in the country. You, you, reading the regs can be more straightforward. California has prob probably the most uh, convoluted set of regs in the country. But um, if, you're, if you're at that level of detail, I, I don't see how you don't read them. So... <laughs> Um, I think there was another part of the, country, the question, like, what's the latest going on? I think that, you know, um, the homeless epidemic, I think, is at the forefront. You know, um, can we really make a dent, you know, on the number of people who are living unhoused in our communities? And, and I think we all want to see that, that resolved just how bad it's gotten. I think that's that's probably the thing 
um, that's at the forefront. I think now it's there's some new work coming through um, because of the racial dynamics from 2020 to really relook at um, how affordable housing, um, you know, uh, supports equity in our communities. Like, um, you know, is it's so complicated. I know I'm touching on this late in our hour, but with the legacy of segregation and racism in housing and real estate, you know, the question really is how do we make sure that afford the affordable housing industry isn't supporting that institutional racism and is actually working to um, to eliminate equity issues and and to create equal opportunity um, for people people of color, especially Black and Indigenous. And I think there's a lot of work there, hopefully that we'll see in the future. I hope so too. And I saw that Dixie had just put in the last question. Now that we're at one, how can people stay connected to you and the work that you're doing? Yes, so um, First Community Housing, of course, we have a website. Uh, we, we're we on LinkedIn and Facebook, but feel free to con connect with me directly. I, I know some folks on here, but I'd love to know more people. Um, my email address is, I don't know if it's on our website, but um, I'm happy to share it with the folks at Coho so that they can share it with the, the folks who attended here today. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm right here in downtown San Jose in Silicon Valley. I'd love to connect with people and, um, and continue the conversation. Thank you so much. And we will be sure to send that information. Dixie just put it in the chat. We'll be sure to send a follow-up email for folks who were able to attend today. So thank you for coming to today's session. Please fill out the survey for future sessions. Thank you so much, Regina, for being our guest today and for this really exciting conversation.